Hello, everybody. Welcome to this panel, and thanks for attending the IEEE PMRC conference. My name is Claudia Campolo. I'm an associate professor at the University of Reggio Calabria in Italy, and today I'm very honored to moderate this panel on V2X connectivity and learning on the road towards cooperative and automated driving. This is the agenda of the panel. I'll start by setting out the context. Then our panelists will share their views and their positions about the main topics of the panel. We will move then to a more interactive discussion before closing with the Q&A session, which hopefully you will contribute to. Why focusing on cooperative automated driving? This is a very off topic. It is close to being a reality. It will revolutionize our mobility in the near future. However, it exhibits uh, several challenging demands. Several issues are still there to be addressed. And uh, it is worth to discuss the key enablers for such an application. Among them, uh, there is a vehicle to everything connectivity, V2X connectivity, which will allow vehicles to exchange data with uh, nearby vehicles, with pedestrians, with the roadside infrastructure, and also with remote entities. Such a connectivity will complement embedded sensors like radars, leaders, positioning systems, and cameras. On a parallel lane, machine learning algorithms are developing. By running on the cloud and also on edge facilities, such algorithms would be able to mine a big amount of data. The data that are collected also thanks to V2X connectivity. Once such data are mined, both human drivers and self-driving vehicles can build a more accurate perception of the surrounding environment and take more intelligent decisions accordingly. V2X connectivity and machine learning techniques as standalone solutions and when interplaying among each other will contribute to a safer, smarter and greener driving. However, such technologies are at their infancy, they are still evolving and several challenges still lie ahead. This paves the way for intriguing interdisciplinary research opportunities. This is why it is worth to discuss such topics today and uh, we will discuss them uh, with uh, an impressive set of panelists. Our speakers are indeed uh, leading experts uh, representing academia, the automotive and telco industries. I would like to thank once again all of them for being here today, although virtually. First speaker is Anwar Tintes, who is senior executive engineer at Toyota Infotech Labs in California. Second speaker is Alessandro Bazzi, senior researcher at the University of Bologna. We will have also Falco Dresler, full professor at the Technical University of Berlin, Maxime Flemann, the CEO of the 5G Automotive Association, and last but not least, uh, Stefano Sorrentino, who is a principal researcher at Ericsson Research in Stockholm, Sweden. So, panelists, the floor is yours. Hello, my name is Onur Altintas. I'm uh, a senior executive engineer and the Infotech Labs fellow at Toyota North America R&D in California, USA. In this short introduction, we will have a brief look at automation and cooperation. The transportation industry in general and auto automotive industry in particular is said to be experiencing a transformation that happens once in 100 years. This transformation is sometimes represented by the acronym CASE, which stands for Connected, Automated, Shared or Services and Electric. In Toyota, we like to put an H uh, in this acronym, we call it CHASE, where H stands for human-centric. 
This picture shows a simplified view of our vehicular communications and computing vision that will support the transformation and the accompanying services uh, in the coming years. In this uh, ecosystem, we have a data center level or the cloud service level on top. We have an edge computing layer in the middle where we have uh, either physical edge servers or what we call virtual edge servers. Okay. On the ground layer, we see all types of vehicles with different communications resources and varying computing resources, sometimes collaborating with each other, sometimes talking to a net server, and sometimes getting services from a cloud. Let's have a look at the evolution of connected mobility services and the types of messages that support those services. Um, you might have heard of day one services, um, which are being deployed in various parts of the world. Uh, in such services, vehicles broadcast what is called or what are known as here I am messages and they basically support safety, efficiency, and environmental purposes. In day two and beyond services, which are being actively studied, investigated in standards bodies and research community, are uh, what we are seeing uh, is, is multiple types of messages. Uh, I have listed some examples here. Um, for example, some of the cars might be telling each other uh, about what their sensors are seeing. <clears throat> some others uh, might be telling um, the vehicles around them uh, their intentions. And some, yet some others might be negotiating with other cars uh, for certain maneuvers that they want to execute. Let's have a look at some examples using uh, sophisticated messages. Uh, in the upper half of this slide, in the box labeled own info, the green vehicle is sending its own information only to the other vehicles around it. In the box labeled as own plus surroundings info, the green vehicle is not only sending its information, but also the information about other objects uh, that are seen by its sensors to the vehicles around it so that the other vehicles can have a better understanding of uh, uh, objects that they are not uh, seeing with their own sensors. In the lower half, we see a cooperative maneuvering example uh, where vehicles exchange uh, desired trajectory and accepted trajectory messages uh, after which they execute maneuvers. Let's also have a quick look at the automotive big data or the vehicle to cloud side of this. The industry is expecting 100 million connected vehicles globally by year 2025, and the data traffic these uh, connected vehicles are expected to be generating is 100 petabytes per month. Uh, to support this uh, much of data, the research community is uh, currently looking at new arch network architectures and computing infrastructure. That's all I have for now. Thank you very much for listening. Hello, I'm Alessandro Bazzi. I'm a researcher at the University of Bologna in Italy, uh, which is the oldest university of the Western world. I've been with the CNR for more than 15 years, which is the largest public research institution in Italy. And I'm also co-founder of the Wireless Laboratory. Uh, we founded it from the University of Bologna, Ferrara, and CNR in 2020. And we are allowed to other groups in Italy working on wireless systems and networks. Um, my work is mainly on connected vehicles. I'm focusing on short-range wireless communication since more than 10 years. Uh, we have today two families of standards. The one coming from the Wi-Fi 11P and Evolution 11BD 
under development. The Silink Cellular V2X for the other family from 3GPP, LTV2X and 5G V2X recently. Uh, today, they are intended for the 5.9 gigahertz band and uh, evolutions in the millimeter wave under, are, are under study and in the development. Today, uh, what is already possible is uh, shown here in this short video, uh, an experiment done with commercial devices. Uh, in principle, vehicles are able to share their position, speed, direction, uh, the security, the, sorry, the safety and the traffic efficiency can be uh, improved tremendously already with, with what we have today. But things are also uh, going on in the standardization bodies, uh, there are several things ongoing for the uh, evolution of, uh, for the implementation of uh, advanced applications like collective perception, vulnerable road user protection, platooning, maneuver coordination. Uh, I'm personally involved uh, in a specialty task force uh, on multi channel operation to uh, define efficient ways to use the several channels that are uh, available uh, in the 5.9 gigahertz ITS band. I also contributed to the uh, studies for the co-channel coexistence of uh, the two families of standards in the same band uh, at the same time. Uh, my activity is also uh, in the implementation of uh, simulation uh, platforms, uh, especially uh, large-scale network simulators needed to investigate uh, uh, the standards we have today and also the uh, improvements that we uh, have in mind for the standards for tomorrow. Uh, but also simulations uh, with the hardware in the loop, uh, in a, uh, able to test uh, uh, the real hardware and software that is going to be implemented on the vehicle uh, within a larger number of uh, scenarios and use cases uh, before it can be tested uh, really on field. Uh, one slide to say what's next. Uh, research activities are already uh, going on, of course, uh, in several directions. These are some of the main directions, the use of higher frequencies, above millimeter waves, also visible light communications and uh, initial studies on the use of terahertz. Uh, full duplexing, the ability to receive concurrently while transmitting. Uh, the use of uh, uh, non-orthogonal multiple assays to improve uh, channel efficiency. Uh, and, and given that the, the resource is really scarce, and drone-assisted communications, both to relay the transmissions and, and to uh, as um, mobile base stations, and uh, the use of meta surfaces to improve uh, the transmission, the quality uh, of communications in, in vehicular communication. Uh, I also added a number uh, two keywords that cannot be forgot because they are everywhere. Uh, in the future of vehicle communications, the use of artificial intelligence and the importance of security uh, to make this uh, really effective in, in the future. Thank you and see you at the panel. Hello, my name is uh, Falko Trasler. I'm coming from the uh, Technical University of Berlin. Um, I'm chair professor there for telecommunication networks. And it's my pleasure to participate in this panel on VTX connectivity and learning on the road towards cognitive automated driving. And um, I want to use the upcoming five minutes to briefly introduce um, myself, my group, uh, our research activities, and of course, how that relates to the panel topic. So when we look at uh, our research portfolio, um, then you see on that slide four pillars that uh, we are mainly focusing on. So going left to right, um, we are focusing on 
what we call heterogeneous wireless and mobile systems. Um, so this is in fact everything that is wireless uh, communication networks uh, based on 5G, 6G, Wi-Fi, um, making use of uh, uh, so-called cross-technology communication. So being able to use um, one network interface, let's say a Wi-Fi access point, classical Wi-Fi access point uh, to also generate waveforms that can be heard and understood and decoded um, at a uh, 5G base station or at a narrowband IoT device. Um, in the second pillar, we look into uh, what we call beyond RF, unconventional communication. And in this field, we are particularly interested also in using uh, new communication technologies like uh, visible light communications or millimeter wave communications that have a huge potential, particularly also in the vehicular uh, environment um, for supporting next generation uh, uh, automated, cooperative automated driving. The third pillar is exactly the main focus of this pillar of this of this panel. Uh, so intelligent transportation systems, and I will explain a little bit more on what we do in this uh, field of intelligent transportation systems on the on a separate slide um, that is that is just coming up. Uh, fourth pillar, um, also very connected to this panel, is machine learning and networking. So we very successfully integrate. Um, uh, deep learning approaches um, for various uh, tasks in the field of networking. So from various channel estimation uh, on the very lower physical layer um, up to uh, applications in the field of intelligent transportation system, decision making of cars. So this portfolio is roughly what we what we do. And um, now let's dig a little bit more deeply into, into the panel topic. So this slide summarizes what we're doing since quite a time, quite some time. Now. So I've been involved in vehicle networking, intelligent transportation systems since like 15 years now. And um, so we have been working on uh, various communication protocol design activities. Um, we supported um, with our research findings the um, uh, current um, uh, standards uh, in, the, in the Etsy world, um, uh, particularly when it comes to congestion aware uh, wireless communications. Our current research focus is very much focused on uh, safety systems for vulnerable road users. So how do we get uh, pedestrians, bicyclists into the picture? So for this, we, for example, developed um, uh, the VCE system, virtual cycling environment. So you see a picture on the uh, bottom right um, where you can uh, use this uh, cycle bicycle here on a trainer on a trainer stand um, uh, to write in a virtual environment. Um, uh, and we can then test protocols and concepts for integrating bicycles. Um, we are still very much interested in the field of platooning. So how we can make our cars uh, driving fully automatedly in a convoy so that we can, uh, all the cars can benefit uh, from uh, first of all, uh, reduce the air track to save energy. Secondly, they are going fully automated using as little space um, as possible on the on the motorway. Um, and we are designing communication protocols. And, and then that is very important to integrate these communication protocols even with the underlying control. So building uh, protocols that integrate uh, uh, control and networking for cyber physical systems. Um, a third uh, bullet that you see here on this uh, slide is uh, called vehicular microclouds. And uh, in this uh, field, we are looking into how we exploit the ICT resources available in the cars, um, also for uh, supporting other road users or users in general um, in the field of uh, mobile edge computing. Um, our systems are getting not only in the field of um, uh, vehicular, but in, in, in many domains and in, in networking, um, getting very complex these days. So when you just look at the at the um, parameter range uh, in, in modern Wi-Fi, LTE, 5G networks, uh, the number of combinations is getting huge. So classical approaches, unfortunately, are no longer able to master this uh, very complex control and management um, uh, tasks. So we apply um, different machine learning approaches to this. Um, so uh, written on the slide here is 
specifically reinforcement learning. Um, reinforcement learning allows to uh, an online training and uh, and uh, use of the of the trained models um, for um, many activities. Um, uh, one good example is the use of the appropriate communication technology in cooperative autonomous driving. Uh, another example uh, where we use reinforcement learning and we then later on switch even to other techniques like LSTM, long short-term memory um, uh, models um, with, um, let's say, enhanced capabilities to um, uh, predict time series um, of um, uh, 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 different different problems, for example, channel behavior, why is channel behavior? Um, so we very successfully applied that on the communication side. We successfully applied it also on the on the cooperative autonomous driving side. And um, uh, how do we do this? Um, well, we, we integrated um, uh, AI uh, toolkits into our simulation tools. So we have uh, uh, integration for the uh, very popular NS3 simulator. It's called NS3 Gym. Um, we uh, provided for a software defined radio uh, based on Clue Radio, it's called GR Gym. And uh, meanwhile, also for the um, for our very, very popular Veins simulator, and uh, that is called now Veins Gym. So one last slide um, about research methodology, because I, I think this is very, very relevant for um, the field in general, and uh, particularly also for this panel. And um, uh, we are uh, uh, focusing our activities uh, both on the simulation-based performance evaluation side, as well as on real, real world uh, experiments and field tests. Anyway, um, simulation only it gives you a very, very tiny insights um, in terms of microscopic um, behavior of nodes, but you can scale. Now, typically with simulation, you can scale and you get the big picture. Um, if you want to get this very microscopic um, uh, uh, insights and or particularly also to validate the simulations, you have to do real-world testing and you have to do field tests. Um, and um, uh, on the simulation side, we of course have our main simulator um, uh, when we integrated with um, uh, network control, um, that is the, what is now called Plexus simulator. And as I mentioned already, um, integrating uh, AI capabilities in the main stream. Uh, in the field testing, uh, we have, for example, our open car to x uh, uh, platform that is uh, able to talk all these at sea protocols. Um, and we have similar activities uh, in the radio field. So thank you very much. Um, I'm very much looking forward to the discussions on the panel. Hello from my side. My name is Maxime Flamand. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of the 5G Automotive Association. First, let me introduce 5G AA. It is a global cross-industry organization that brings together the voice of the automotive and telecommunication industries. 5GA covers all aspects of 3GPP defined CV2X, obviously the technology and the standards, but also allocation of spectrums, regional policies around the world, as well as testing, security and go-to-market strategies. 5GA believes that 3GPP mobile communication standards for vehicle connectivity known as cellular V2X represent the best opportunity to deliver CITS services quickly and at scale on every road. Besides the usual infotainment and telematics functionalities, it enables a comprehensive road safety and traffic efficiency solution. It enables the vehicles to connect with other vehicles, roadside equipment, pedestrians and cyclists. All this is complemented with the connectivity to the mobile networks for all sorts of services via internet. To set the record, what we call 5G V2X is a combination of radio access technologies. First, it combines the long range LTE 5G mobile network access and short range direct communication LTE V2X and RV2X for an integrated radio. For the short range, LTE V2X delivers basic safety message and NRV2X is for advanced driving. I would like to bring three main points to the discussions today. One, the role of 5G to bring a new advanced driving at scale with cooperative perception, path planning, coordinated maneuvers, and dynamic map updates. For us, 5G V2X is a, unleashing a true path towards automated functionalities using state-of-the-art standardized radio interfaces. Second, safety treatment to trust V2X messages in an automated driving world. 
if we seriously want V2X messages from third-party vehicles and roadside, we need to integrate the highest level of trust, meaning reliability and integrity. This can only be done if you approach V2X as one additional sensor used by the vehicle in its decision platform. 5G V2X brings trust to another level for V2X safety treatment. Third, the role of edge computing to deliver edge uh, services at scale, notably the cross MNO, cross OEM environment. What happens when a vehicle rely on edge services that is hosted by another MNO? What happens when two vehicles are running the same edge service at the same location, but hosted by two different MNOs? And how do we guarantee continuity of edge services between MNOs across borders at global scale? With this, I would like to thank PIM RLC for their invitation and look forward to the interactive session. Hello, and thanks for joining this seminar. My name is Stefan Sorrentino. I'm a principal researcher at Ericsson Research, where I'm responsible for automotive, transportation, and public safety. If we look at the way we used to drive vehicles and the way automated vehicles are uh, driving on the roads, we see that this is what used to be the the role of our own senses and planning actions, of course, are being taken by onboard sensors and data-driven algorithms. And I think it's a bit striking to see how our eyes and ears are actually being replaced by a large number of sensors. We have uh, short uh, and uh, long-range radars, we have sometimes sliders, we have cameras, ultrasonic sensors, and so on. And why is that? Well, uh, these sensors, they definitely have strengths, but they also have important limitations. They have sometimes a narrow field of view. They may have limited range. They depend on the weather. And most of all, they have limited reliability. And that, in order to achieve the very stringent safety uh, requirements of uh, automotive on public roads, uh, one needs to consider redundant information from multiple sensors. So when we ask ourselves, what will the role be for communication in uh, the future automated vehicle? Uh, I think one possible role is about complementing the onboard sensors data. And that can be done in two ways. One is to add even more redundant data. So type of short range, uh, perception data. But I think what is even more in interesting is when we exploit uh, the capabilities of communication to achieve data and processing that is simply not possible to achieve on board the vehicle or with the capabilities of the onboard sensors. It's, of course, impossible to predict how use cases are going to look in five to 10 years from now. But I think we get some good hints if we analyze the present situation. Uh, if you look at uh, public roads and wide area networks today, we see really an explosion of connected vehicles uh, and services, but they, but they primarily focus on driver assistance, telematics, software updates, entertainment of the passengers. It's a lot of data, but it's primarily best effort data. So we still do not see a strong growth of QS demanding services on public roads. Um, the situation, however, is different in confined areas, where a confined area could be something like industrial site, a logistics area, um, and uh, or harbor maybe. And there we see uh, much higher levels of automation, uh, often unmanned vehicles. And they demand use cases such as sensor sharing, like exploiting, for example, infrastructure-based sensors, and um, use cases that imply coordination, central coordination of the different vehicles, and in some cases, offloading complexity and computation from the vehicles towards the central infrastructure, where the most extreme case is remote operation. All these cases rely on very high QS. And 
sort of deterministic service from the network. So I believe that in the coming years, we're going to see some of these type of use cases that today we see in confined areas to uh, spill over towards um, public roads. And that may happen in two ways. The first one is that the definition of confined area will expand. Maybe in five years, uh, a highway across countries can be considered a confined area if it has certain guarantees of connectivity. Uh, but also, I think it's a long process for uh, car makers to really adapt the way they design and they test their vehicles to really take into account the specific capabilities of networks and really to be able to integrate and rely on them and trust them uh, for safety critical uh, applications. So if we try to put a bit of a uh, border between the evolution of 5G use cases and what could be more uh, 6G use cases, I believe one possible to look at them is that I think in 5G we can really achieve a very high trust in data uh, that is delivered through a cellular network. But I think there is some limit in uh, the level of guarantee that we can give about that data coming within a certain timeline or being um, available if we consider the, the safety requirement and the number of nines that are needed in automotive for safety applications. Um, however, there are really advanced use cases that are that are going to be implemented in the coming uh, years, which, um, for example, which have the, the, the specific characteristic that they allow to delay a decision, an important decision that might have uh, safety implications, but that is possible to delay. So for example, a vehicle overtaking assistance is one example. It is of course a very critical decision, but if the vehicle at any time feels that it doesn't have all the needed information, it will not start the overtaking. I think we can try to remove that assumption when we move into 6G timeframe and really uh, design the system uh, in a way that it will be robust enough with enough redundancies and observability so that it will be able to even uh, take urgent decisions, which if they're not taken within certain time, they will have uh, safety implications. So the main key messages I want to give is, the first one is that I really believe that communication is going to extend the role of onboard sensors and uh, complement them in that way. Uh, for example, by uh, providing optimal computational power and infrastructure-based data. But also, um, I believe that in a 6 g context, we need to uh, design things a little bit differently from a system level. Uh, we need a tighter cooperation between applications and networks. And uh, I think um, we need to look at reliability not just from a link perspective, but more also from a system level. Uh, and that will eventually have strong uh, implications also on the radio interface. But I think it's a little bit of a more systematic view that we need to have. So thank you for your attention. I hope it was interesting. So I guess that now it's time to, to go live. Hello once again to all the people who's joining uh, the, the panel. All the panelists are ready, I guess, to answer the questions. Now, we have a set of questions that actually have been already posted uh, on, uh, on the website. So we will start uh, with them. Then we will move to a Q&A session where also the audience could, uh, could ask questions to, to our panelists. So they are ready. For sure, the, the question will, uh, will cover some themes that you have already touched during, uh, during your talk, but I guess that uh, they would be helpful uh, to go deeper 
in some aspects that we have touched that maybe it is worth uh, to analyze more in detail. So let us start with the applications. I've heard of all of you and I've heard that you have mentioned the wide variety of applications. You have mentioned uh, the evolutionary path from day one uh, basic ser safety service applications to day two advanced safety applications. You mentioned the need to go for applications with the higher quality of service to be guaranteed. So I would like to ask uh, whether you think that uh, uh, there are some applications that could challenge more connectivity solutions and also machine learning techniques. These are the two main uh, enablers for uh, cooperative and automated driving, VETUX connectivity and machine learning. So which are the applications that uh, could be more challenging? And uh, I would like also to know from you whether you think that they could have some uh, impact on our society. It's not only a matter of connecting vehicles or letting them uh, cooperate, exchange maneuver, but also to put into the picture pedestrians, for instance. So I would like to hear first, uh, maybe Maxime, since uh, he's a representative of the 5GA, bringing together the telco and the automotive world. Maxime, could you provide some... Uh, some opinions yes, about you're it. Giving me the, you're giving me the difficult task to start. Thank you, Claudia. Um, yeah, well, first of all, we, uh, we are trying to avoid uh, the name killer application, that's for sure. Um, that's the kind of things we try to avoid in our discussions. But, uh, you know, if I could pick uh, one that, that has um, attracted a lot of uh, discussions over the, the past few years, it's, um, it's one that is, not so uh, far-fetched is uh, uh, it's what we commonly refer to teleoperated driving, but there are many different aspects of teleoperated driving. Uh, obviously, uh, when you're thinking teleoperation, you're thinking uh, um, uh, that uh, someone somewhere somewhere else in a control room is 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 actually controlling uh, the. Uh, fully the vehicle, but it's not always like this. You know, um, you can you can do the operation just in small steps uh, by um, telling what the vehicle should do when it's stuck or when it's not uh, in a in a situation where it, um, it 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 can act on itself. Uh, and so the these kind of um, uh, different kinds of teleoperation is interesting to, to see evolve, evolving over the next, uh, I would say, seven to 10 years. And uh, obviously when we see uh, what we have today, it's more teleoperation in a confined environment or in control area, like uh, Stefano was explaining. Uh, where, whereas uh, perhaps in a couple of years, you're going to start having low speed automation uh, and low speed teleoperation, like in automated valet parking. And, and gradually you're going to see this. And, and step by step, you're going to get more challenges for the V2X connectivity, where at one point um, uh, we are going to see the full power of the 5G uh, access, uh, more radio access and, and the, core, the core network technologies. Yeah, you raised a very, a very good point. Uh, teleoperated driving is somehow uh, forgot when we focus on short range uh, connectivity solutions since most of the efforts now are on, are on side link. Uh, but uh, it is worth to consider teleoperated driving starting from uh, critical and small area as uh, Stefano mentioned uh, during, uh, during this talk. Uh, mentioned, and uh, maybe Stefano could uh, comment more on this uh, or also answer the questions. Uh, hmm. Absolutely, I think it's also important uh, really to, to think how many years ahead are we looking at because things will change quite a lot. Just to put things in perspective, uh, our internal study says that at least until 2025, if we look at traffic generated towards uh, cellular networks along highways, 
but the, <clears throat> the type of traffic that will by far dominate capacity of the network is not from the vehicle, it's from the passengers of the vehicle. So it will be entertainment of the passengers. So uh, we, need to, we need to consider these kind of things because that part is going to drive the capacity of the network and even its development more than the, uh, the actual uh, vehicular type of use cases. But of course, um, the vehicular uh, use cases are expanding uh, a lot. Teleoperation is one of those with the toughest requirements on the network. Also, it's very tough on the uplink, which is particularly di difficult. And uh, if we talk about um, public areas, sometimes they are not in very um, tightly inhabited areas. So the use case is a bit difficult, and this triggers innovation uh, not always uh, towards increasing high peaks and extreme KPIs, but also towards having deployments which deliver coverage, more uniform performance, but at a, at a reasonable cost uh, of deployment and for the final users. Uh, regarding use cases, I think um, I think that evolution from today having all the intelligence on the vehicle moving at gradually at least part of that intelligence towards the infrastructure, uh, central cloud and edge cloud, so different levels of distributions, uh, and also the relationship between the vehicles, the road users, uh, the infrastructure, um, starting with relatively basic sensor sharing, going into uh, intention sharing. Uh, and the true cooperation eventually. I think that is definitely, there are lots of challenges around that. Okay, so uh, you have touched another, another point uh, also, uh, edge computing, uh, cloud computing, uh, and uh, I guess that uh, Honor could also comment on this uh, since uh, in his talk mentioned this and uh, as a representative of the other side of the um, automotive world, uh, he could uh, add for sure something Thanks, uh, Claudia. Um, well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not really good at predicting the future, so I'll be in a generic level. Um, so one interesting quote that I came across recently, just by chance, is, uh, is a quote from biologist um, Sidney Brenner and uh, in his Nobel Prize lecture in 2002, he says, we are drowning in a sea of data and starving for knowledge. Um, of course, he said that in a totally different context, but if, if, if we just apply it literally to what we will see in, in, in the coming years in our area, uh, we can expect uh, the stillage of data that's coming to our servers, uh, whether it's an OEM server, whether it's a public cloud or edge servers. And uh, we will find ourselves trying to uh, extract or abstract knowledge from the patterns in that data uh, so that we don't push that, that data from one point to the other point we just use the extractive knowledge in 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 a uh, in an intelligent way. Uh, in in the vehicle to vehicle level, maybe we can expect um, seeing some uh, uh, not all but some row sensor or row data type of data sharing in between the vehicles. Uh, of course, there are hurdles right now for doing that, but we also see. Uh, uh, promising technologies in, in that direction. Thank you. Thank you, Honor, for, for, for sharing also your, your view. Now maybe we can uh, involve uh, the, the researcher from, uh, from academia. Uh, Falco, would you add something more about question number one? Uh, thanks a lot, Claudia, for, for asking. Um, um, in, in general, there's very little to add uh, to to what our our what the previous speakers already mentioned. Uh, so let me um, uh, may, maybe maybe let's let's pick up two examples for for what what are, I consider really is, is very challenging for for cooperative driving these days. And um, 
the first scenario is um, let's just use two automated cars, no cooperation included, and let them drive through, let's say, an Italian city, right? Um, narrow streets, very narrow streets. Um, so if they if they meet each other uh, coming from opposite directions, what they will do is they will stop um, and they will wait forever until somebody comes and builds bigger streets. Um, because um, uh, all, the, all the algorithms have been, have been developed with safety in, in mind as a first and uh, foremost the directive. Um, if we have cooperation, so adding, adding cooperation in the, in, into the picture, we may allow the local algorithms, which are typically machine learning based, to explore, let's say, not only really unsafe, but let's say less constricted, uh, less restricted um, areas of the of the algorithmic uh, solution space. So maybe at some point, uh, just using this this cooperation, they will pass each other, um, which would be a, would be an awesome step number one. Step number two, maybe doing that at an intersection, a very frequented intersection uh, where cars are coming with lots of, uh, uh, from, from different directions, um, many cars, high speed, uh, let them pass this intersection as quickly as possible, right? Uh, hopefully without stopping. And um, so what you need for, for doing so is, uh, is, a, is a big picture, what, what's really going on. And this is exactly what our main, emphasis in, in providing a connectivity and providing new machine learning algorithms, um, assessing situation very quickly, uh, running inference in, in, the, in the trained machine learning models very quickly. So to uh, enable these cars to, to uh, let's say, manage this, this, this uh, uh, driving situation. And um, even more complicated, and um, that is my, my final comment to this, is if we get other participants into the picture. Right? So um, road traffic is not just about cars, road traffic is about bicyclists. So I'm, I'm having bicyclists. Uh, so every day using my bicycle and um, always running into unsafe situations. Pedestrians, uh, same situation. So how do we get them into the picture? Um, providing connectivity, adding our decision-making um, or updating our decision-making in a way that um, we are not just uh, car and automotive focused, but um, also enable situation management for, for the vulnerable road users. So that is a challenge. Uh, maybe we can even call that killer application. <laughs> yeah, you raise uh, actually several, several issues uh, and you add uh, a lot of things uh, into this uh, very already quite complex uh, landscape. Uh, I don't know if uh, Alessandro would, would add more before passing to the next uh, question. Thank you, Claudia. Well, uh, let me uh, just uh, uh, remark that uh, uh, what, what just uh, uh, Falco said is, is in, in the path of uh, uh, collective perception. And, and indeed, collective perception is not really in applications, but a service uh, in the terms of, of the standards, which allows a number of applications and for V2X is uh, what is expected to be very challenging. Until now, uh, most of the studies were on awareness and now all the studies are moving to perception and this increases the amount of data and this uh, increases the issues for connectivity uh, and this is expected what we want to see and maybe this could help also in the penetration because uh, until we have only awareness, uh, vehicles need to be aware of each other. When we add perception, uh, even if we have only some of the vehicles equipped, still the perception allows uh, to have a higher uh, perception of the, of the world. So this maybe will uh, help putting really V2X on the road. Okay, thank you, Alessandro, also for sharing uh, your, your view. So you have discussed several applications. Most of them are very, very demanding and uh, for sure they will uh, ask for uh, more performing connectivity solution. So the next question is about uh, a sort of kind of suggestion that you can provide. Uh, you have mentioned 5G, you have mentioned the evolution of uh, 5G. 
uh, as a key connectivity solution for V2X. But for sure, we need something more. So which is your suggestion? Uh, which is the technology you would suggest maybe to a PhD student uh, uh, to investigate uh, as the game changer for, for the next years? I mentioned here communication technology and networking technology, but uh, as also Honor said in, uh, in his previous talk, uh, we have networking that is getting uh, closer and closer to computing. So you can, of course, comment about uh, cloud and, uh, comp and that computing technology. So um, maybe Falco could start uh, uh, since uh, uh, you mentioned uh, some technologies that uh, you, you have this very background, very a uh, large background uh, on uh, on networking. You are a networking guy. I heard uh, several times uh, you define yourself as a networking guy, so you can start. Okay, I do. Um, so the so I, I mean already now we, we we are using multiple communication technologies at the same time in the in the automotive world. So um, if you if you buy a, a recently modern car, then um, what you get is at least a 4G, now 5G modem, so you will be connected, you will be connected tomorrow using a 6G network. Um, Wi-Fi is in the cars, um, so uh, there's, there's, there's lots of, of opportunities. Other people at the moment work on uh, integrating additional communication technologies um, in the scope of 5G, 6G, also millimeter wave uh, links, um, not only to the base stations, to the cellular base stations, but primarily also between cars, directly between cars, um, making use of um, or also the, the frequencies used for automotive radar, um, using visible light communications um, uh, by just modulating digital information on top of the LED lights, uh, actually being used for uh, lighting a, a scenery, but um, why, not, why not using that as a, as a communication means? No? Um, there is one more thing to this, um, and um, that is um, possibly also coming up in, in one of your next questions, Claudia. But uh, let me let me already emphasize on it now, and then I then I keep silent in the next step. Um, uh, one 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 big component of already five G networks, which will become even more important in six, in six G, is edge computing. So meaning that we don't have just communication from, from the car to a, to a back-end cloud service, but um, to a very local edge server. And the, the, the big question is, which is this edge server? So where is this edge server? So um, deployment, at the moment at least, it looks like it's, it's becoming very, very, very slow. Um, so there are, for example, project running together with um, Uno here in, in, in the room um, uh, with Toyota, um, where we use simply cars as edge servers, mobile edge servers, um, which gives um, um, ICT capabilities, so compute capabilities, uh, processing capabilities, um, very next to where they are needed, for example, by a pedestrian or a vulnerable road user in general. So communication technologies are out there. So there will not be that much of a change, except of course some, some smaller uh, issues like um, uh, uh, yet another um, change of the, of the modulation techniques or uh, coding is a very important uh, question that, that further needs to be investigated. But how the mix of these communication technologies works out in the end, that is, that is the big challenge. Yeah, thank you for sharing uh, your opinion as well. Uh, you said that maybe technologies are already there, and it's just a matter of uh, having a proper mesh up of them, but uh, maybe it's not so easy. Maybe we need to investigate some existing technology and also to adapt them for, uh, for V2X. Maybe we have some technologies and Alessandro mentioned some of them at the, at the end. Maybe you would like to comment about these. Uh, yeah, I, I, I also agree with Falco. Uh, the use of several technologies, all the technologies together, uh, and, and using different parts of the spectrum at the same time is mandatory to achieve the quality of service required by the applications. Uh, just to add something, um, we, we can also think that in the case of vehicular, we have devices that have uh, different characteristics than normal mobile phones or 
uh, other devices, we can consider higher costs, uh, higher power, and this makes uh, some kind of uh, advanced receiver characteristics like interference cancellation, uh, aspects that normally uh, are maybe far in the future for uh, small devices and can be maybe uh, more uh, nearer in the future for, for uh, devices that go on vehicles and can have higher cost and higher power. Uh, just to remark uh, in part of the question, what would you give to a PhD student? Uh, it, it's good to remark uh, that uh, I'll do not exactly within the question, uh, security here uh, is really something that will be uh, key in the future because security here means uh, safety, means uh, life. So it's, it's really a key point, even more than in the other verticals. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Security is a is a very, a very crucial concern for uh, for Beto X. Uh, uh, so one of you, maybe uh, Stefan or Maxim, I don't remember, said that uh, um, connectivity is another sensor. It's not just a matter of adding another sensor. We have to trust the messages coming from nearby vehicles, and. Uh, as a telco representative, again, Stefano, uh, can we trust uh, uh, messages coming from uh, other vehicles or com from the network or should I, uh, instead focus on uh, our own sensors? Uh, um, and, and of, of I, course, I believe, this is yes, no, but I, I, be, I believe that, but it's um, <clears throat> that trust in my opinion, is a bit, uh, is built in a slightly different way than what we thought so far. So my, my opinion is that in the coming five years, uh, at least some of us, we will be doing right what we did wrong in the last five years. <laughs> um, I think in, especially in the beginning of 5G, uh, for maybe the first time we had these two, two industries, telecom and um, and automotive talking to each other and I think we really asked from for the automotive tell us your requirements 10 years from now and honestly we got all possible numbers and then they asked us okay tell us the solutions and I'm sure we gave at least equally confusing answers. Um, I think probably we used a bit of a wrong methodology that uh, that in my opinion will not lead to developing um, solutions that are really safe. Safety, especially um, in an automotive um, perspective, is a, is a system um, metric. It's not something you fix with uh, one URLC link. Uh, and, uh, and it has to be possible to deploy it. It has to be available. There are many aspects. And, um, so I think we need to probably design the new system and the evolution of the current systems uh, really with a more of a end-to-end um, -end perspective, considering the fact that, of course, we have the radios, but we also have the IT um, perspective, which is essential to, to have a solution which is scalable, which is a must for this type of industry. Uh, we need, of course, to have the ONM perspective, they have relatively long uh, cycles for developing technology. That means things need to be um, available for prototyping something like four years before uh, a possible product. Uh, and this has to be linked with our research cycles in telecommunication and in academia, and also with solutions that are sustainable from a cost perspective. So, this has all to be considered together in order to achieve that safety level in the solution, which will allow us to trust sensors. Thank you, Stefano. Yeah. You raised some very, very good points. Sustainability, we will be back uh, to, to this point. Uh, and uh, you mentioned the need to go for end to end uh, approaches. Uh, and also we need uh, uh, to let automotive and uh, telco industry to talk uh, more to talk uh, and uh, to exchange the, their ideas 
And I guess that 5GA uh, somehow has this uh, quite ambitious uh, objective. And uh, maybe Maxime can uh, comment on this and also on the, on the question that is there, question number two. Yeah, Claudia, thanks. Um, I think, I mean, the, the, the challenge of trust is clear. Huh? So, and I mentioned it in my intro, but um, so when, uh, when you're talking about 6G, I think there is some opportunities to grasp uh, in the future is uh, to, um, to see that uh, at the end of the day, when we are designing a communicating, a, a connectivity system, what we want to achieve is both connectivity on one side, but also sensing. And, uh, and all these sensing part in general, you know, the sensors that you put on the cars, et cetera, uh, they are also using uh, uh, waveforms to, to, to somehow uh, either position yourself or position the other uh, vehicles around, et cetera. So if, if there is some, and if I, if I would, ask someone that, that is smart and young and has plenty of time, I'd like to ask him, okay, what can you actually do uh, with the connectivity that you have today? But at the same time, in the same waveforms, you just use them also to sense the world around you. And uh, you can see around, you can already see clearly that um, in 3GPP discussions on uh, position or using the network to position yourself is, is, is huge. Uh, and I believe it's going to be even even more. And so, if if I can see six G uh, coming up to the horizon, I'd say I'd say that uh, these two words that are merging between um, connectivity uh, and 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 sending bits and bits and bytes between each other, and also sensing at the same time, uh, and 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 eventually doing the same with the same spectrum, uh, would would be a great achievement. Um, uh, but I had also other ideas that were um, could be raised. It's it's um, it's the it's all the aspects of self-organization of the systems and of your networks, especially when you have different uh, frequency bands at your disposal, and then you you want to make the best out of uh, out of it when you have to connect and and sense the world. Um, that. So the self-organizing aspects, we have seen only a, a small glimpse of it uh, in, in the previous systems like 5G, but, but it's going to become huge. And then uh, another aspect that I like uh, to see is, um, I think it was mentioned right earlier for, by Falco, is, is the fact that at the end of the day, you don't know where the edge is. Uh, where is the edge? Uh, the, the, ve the vehicles that you're, you're seeing today uh, that have some level three capabilities or even claiming level four, they are they are supercomputers on wheels. They have a super, they have some dedicated um, um, computing power that 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 could be sourced. Are they the edge or uh, is the edge at the end of the day at the, in the control of the mobile network and in the core network? Um, so. At one point, you're going to see that the edge is going to be a bit blurred, and uh, and the side link for this is going to bring uh, a new dimension because you instead of doing, instead of relying on your mobile network, you may rely on a mesh of uh, of of uh, connectivity uh, supported by the mobile network, but not uh, the the core of the. Uh, connectivity or the core of the transmission of the data does not necessarily have to pass through the mobile network in the core network. Um, okay, I, I'll stop I, here. I know that there was, oh, okay. uh, Stefano, Stefano mentioned a lot of nice things here, but I just wanted to add a little bit uh, on, on top of it. <laughs> okay, thank you, Maxime. You have mentioned uh, vehicular edge computing, and uh, you raise a good point uh, uh, where is the edge, as Falco said, and how also uh, can we manage uh, the, the edge uh, when considering the mobility? We have the issue of a uh, cross border, we have uh, endover of edge services, <laughs> somehow the seamless uh, uh, execution of edge services should be guaranteed. 
And uh, a big issue there for sure is uh, the fact that we will have uh, uh, different operators and we will back to the issue of uh, interoperability and uh, interoperator um, harmonization and uh, cooperation. Before going to the next uh, question, maybe uh, Honor uh, has something to add. Uh, thanks again, Claudia. Um, well, it's probably going to be just a summary of what everybody else said. Um, I, spectrum is, is continuing to be an issue, so uh, we might expect uh, uh, some good research on that front. Um, so spectrum sharing is once again coming as a keyword in this area. Uh, I would I would also think that it's not spec, only spectrum sharing the spectrum between different entities in 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 the network, but also uh, sharing of the spectrum in the sense that uh, this integration or merging of communications and sensing could happen at some point. Um, one example of that is is of course using radar frequencies for uh, communications as well, or or reversing it, starting with the communications and using it also as a radar. Um, that's one thing uh, actively being investigated in the research domain and, and Maximo is hinting that uh, as well. So in addition to spectrum, I think in general, we can list uh, uh, scalability, reliability, and low latency techniques, uh, as well as security uh, uh, coming up as, uh, as uh, good research topics. Thank you. Thank you, Honor. I would profit uh, you, you are uh, with, uh, with the mic and uh, with the video which is on. Uh, I would uh, ask you to comment on the question number three. Since uh, you had one slide with uh, automotive big data uh, as the title, if I'm not wrong, and uh, you mentioned this the big amount of data that are generated by vehicles and by the all uh, environment related to, to mobility. And uh, I would ask you first uh, uh, to comment about the potential and also the challenges that are related to machine learning as a technique to get knowledge from all such data. And uh, in order to improve uh, connectivity, Falco mentioned in his talk uh, um, channel estimation, for instance, but also applications themselves could benefit from machine learning. Could you tell us something about this? Yes, thank you. And again, uh, we are seeing machine learning in two different parts of the system. It's one in the cloud and one in the uh, 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 vehicles itself. Um, as I was hinting previously, uh, extracting that knowledge or abstracting that and, and using it in different domains will be uh, an interesting topic. Um, so knowledge, uh, will sometimes pertain to uh, traffic patterns in a certain area. It might uh, also be relevant to connectivity patterns, spectrum usage patterns. So, so in different uh, domains, you can use that knowledge. Um, what, what, what I'm trying to hint at is, uh, like, like Falco was mentioning, it, it's probably going to be a multitude of systems um, an heterogeneous system of communications in the car. And um, probably you cannot afford um, using all of those systems all of the time because of efficiency and effectivity uh, uh, issues. So I would imagine uh, the help of a contextual uh, system, uh, uh, which makes use of that knowledge that I was mentioning. Uh, could be uh, playing a role in V2X connectivity. Thank you. Thank you, Honor. And um, again, uh, machine learning can be seen from the from different perspectives. Is uh, cross-cutting technologies not totally a matter of applying such techniques, but also having the good tool uh, for applying it. Uh, Falco in his uh, in his talk mentioned. Uh, a nice uh, uh, extension of a uh, simulator, network simulator that uh, uh, his team uh, uh, realized in order to put AI 
into network simulations. Maybe you can comment more on this and also asking, uh, you can also uh, answer into to the question number three, Falco. Um, this would be quite of self self promotion, isn't it? Uh, it's not really it's not really fair. But um, yes, uh, but I mean, um, there are a couple of tools. Let's let's phrase it that way. There are a couple of tools out there. Meanwhile, that um, bring AI frameworks um, uh, together with uh, classical network simulation. Um, so this mainstream uh, from our group is only one of the of the currently developed tools, uh, but um, it is very important to get expertise uh, from the two fields. So from the more CS oriented um, uh, machine learning uh, field with the typically more double E oriented um, uh, telecommunications field, um, because uh, they can learn a lot from each other. And um, machine learning is not only being used for what is, what is currently being done for the automated driving, um, object recognition, and so on and so forth. But it's extremely powerful when it comes to optimizing connectivity here. And that is exactly your question. So as a very toy example, um, uh, we, we played around um, using a machine learning, a reinforcement learning based uh, model for switching communication channels um, uh, to communicate uh, between, between neighboring cars, so just for V2V communication. And even so, being a toy example, it from from day one it outperformed easily um, uh, solutions we have been working on for for years on, a, on a, an engineering basis. So there is a there is a huge potential, and um, um, at least um, many of us are, including me, definitely uh, we are just in the in the very first starting steps to to um, I don't know just learn learn how to walk rather than run and. Um, I can I can just invite everybody uh, in our research community to to join these efforts. Um, so um, machine learning has been very very successfully being used already for um, uh, predicting channel conditions um, for different wireless channels, um, predicting the best use of, for example, modulation encoding schemes for for some channels, um, uh, predicting the use of the technology to to um, to rely upon so we did some switch between uh, millimeter wave channels and uh, sub six gigahertz channels um, so there's a, a huge potential here and um, the research community just starts okay you mentioned the potential and which is the challenge that you see do you see any challenge in applying machine learning yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the world is full we of have, challenge. Have again we, okay. we, we are just trying to work Right. Um, okay. That's that's that. I, I mean that very honestly. So we are just trying to work, and the use of um, of uh, neural networks, uh, particularly if you go into deep neural networks, is is terribly complicated. And sometimes, um, for me, it looks like more more like magic than 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 um, I don't know, no, uh, uh, engineering at least. Um, so getting getting deeper into this, how understanding these models. Um, uh, also, the, the, this, there's a big research branch now on, on explainability of, of machine learning, which is, which is extremely important, not just relying on our field. This is, this is, a, this is a big challenge of the, of, of the research community as a whole. Um, for us, um, so to, to talk about a real concrete uh, work that we are currently um, uh, doing and for what we are working on is um, uh, the distribution of the training, which is which is terribly complex as well, right? In inference uh, using machine learning is very easy. It's fast. It's uh, lightweight. Um, uh, but where where to train the models? No? Um, this is a big question. Um, the cars typically have enough um, uh, GPU power to do so. Yes, possible. Um, on my smartphone, it's already questionable. Um, and um, if, if, I, if I don't have the most recent uh, smartphone at hand, but a two, three years old one, then training on the system is kind of impossible, it's prohibitive. So you have to train somewhere else. Um, and then the question is how to get the data there um, in order to train. Where is, where is this where, where you train? Privacy comes in as a question. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of research now, now uh, going on in the field of federated learning, for example to make learning in a distributed way as privacy preserving as possible. And um, then only transmitting um, uh, trained models or at least actually 
um, subsets of trained models that you can uh, combine in, 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 in different places again, so that the server in the cloud only gets trained models or increments of trained models, but not the data itself, um, which is uh, from a privacy perspective, a, a very important step. So there's tons of challenges, Claudia. I, I, I don't yes, know where yeah, to yeah, start yeah. actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but it's worth to mention them and it is worth to mention, as you said, somehow that uh, there is a, a big challenge for, uh, for us networking people, I would say, uh, since we need to transfer such data from, from point to another. And it is uh, uh, the, the network that, that could play a role in uh, properly routing these, uh, these packets uh, among different uh, computing machines, our vehicles, our parked vehicle uh, somewhere, our smartphone or the edge server or somewhere else. So thank you, Falco. Actually, maybe we are a bit late for this question. So there is a, a room for one minute uh, more for uh, uh, Maxime, Stefan and Alessandro. Would you like to add something more? We have one minute. Yeah, I can, I can just add, uh, you know, Machine learning is, is nice, obviously. Um, you can do plenty of things with it. Um, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the current, uh, some of the current challenges of, um, um, of um, self-configurable kind of networks. Uh, but when, I, when I'm talking about, for example, a multitude of sensors that you put on the road network, and, and at one point, uh, what I feel that is going to be very difficult or, or challenging is to calibrate all these sensors so that they can work in a cooperative manner. And, um, and I'm pretty sure that with the, the, the cognitive capability of the V2X connectivity, you can start, uh, you can have uh, intelligent and smart algorithms that are going to uh, fine tune the calibration of each of the sensors so that, and then, and then eventually in, increase the trust of the sensors in, as an, in the whole um, uh, sensing ecosystem. And, and there I, um, it will perhaps save a lot of time for our road operators and road engineers that are putting sensors on the, on the roadside and thinking that they will contribute. But at the end of the day, uh, as they are not very well cal calibrated, you, don't, you cannot use them. So, um, so hopefully, um, it, it's not necessarily ma machine learning, but it can be solved with machine learning, actually. So. Okay, anyone else would, uh, would add something uh, to this uh, question, Alessandro or Stefano, very quick, or otherwise we move to the next question. Just very quick, maybe uh, we mentioned the, the choices of the vehicle from connectivity and automation but also the choices before transmission, the selection of the information to send will be at some point, something that will need additional help because increasingly we will have a lot of data to transmit and that's too much. That's just a small contribution. Yeah, we are uh, um, towards uh, the need for uh, semantic communication. We need to know in advance what, uh, uh, we, we need to transfer in order to improve their transmission. So that, that's a very good point, very challenging point. Also, that is quite cross layer. Stefano? I think let's move to the next question. I think we can uh, yeah. jump on this. Um, yeah, we, we are a bit late otherwise. Uh, thank, thank you, Stefano. You have time to, to talk later. And uh, I guess that uh, so far we have provided a quite uh, comprehensive overview of the V2X environment. We started from the applications, we discussed the uh, connectivity solution and also these uh, technologies, these techniques that can help V2X, which are AI and machine learning. Now, the next step is to understand uh, and uh, to comment about uh, evaluation methodologies. Uh, and uh, we have uh, several uh, simulators available, uh, a few, some field trials have been conducted. But uh, um, to my understanding, there is still room for improvement uh, in these, uh, these uh, regards. And uh, I would like to 
uh, know your opinion uh, and uh, if you can provide uh, some hints about uh, the the direction to follow in order to improve evaluation methodologies uh, needed to evaluate uh, all these uh, disruptive technologies and solutions for instance uh, uh, i remember mm, the very first simulator coupling together mobility and networking and uh, now maybe it's time to add the ai we mentioned before but maybe it's time to add into the network simulator also the environment we need to describe the environment in order to make our simulations uh, more realistic and more accurate and on the other end uh, concerning uh, data sets uh, and concerning ai do we have enough uh, real world data sets this is my my question and i would like to hear um, your uh, your view alessandro would you start uh, since you also mentioned the simulators Th in your talk thank you claudia yeah the, the point is that uh, um, field trials uh, are, are are interesting are fine but uh, more than in other uh, cases uh, vehicular needs simulations because only simulations are allowed to make large scale tests uh, uh, reputability uh, safety uh, is is a problem with with the uh, v2x and uh, we have a number of simulators and and this also demonstrates the interest in, in this direction um, maybe I can just give, put emphasis on the uh, increasing interest uh, for hardware in the loop simulators. That is in the direction Claudia mentioned, having the environment to uh, connect it to the real devices. So we can test the devices, but not really on field, but inside a, a simulation. And this is really challenging because it requires real time. That is normally not something uh, considered in simulations, but we need also uh, large scale tests, uh, and, and, and this is uh, really an issue that, uh, in, in my view, is at the initial stage for the research and, and in the industry. Thank you, Alessandro. Alco, would you add more if you have anything uh, since you have touched at this point before? If you have something more to add? Um... Maybe maybe just a call to um, to all our research community um, and you actually, Claudia, mentioned one of the most uh, important um, um, let's say tasks for us as researchers at the moment that is collect data sets and uh, to share data sets um, that we can use for reproducible research, um, particularly when it comes to machine learning. So to be able to evaluate uh, algorithms uh, in a in a very controlled environment and that only works with massive data sets uh, which our community is not always sharing at the moment um, uh, so it's just a an, an, an call for um, thinking about it and um, making making data sets available all the time yeah yeah we should go for uh, open science open data and uh, open source for sure i don't know if the um, automotive uh, manufacturer can can help uh, somehow to make uh, such data relevant to the vehicle available. I don't know, Honor, if you can comment on this point and on the whole question, of course. Uh, thanks, Claudia. Do you mean the data set itself or the vehicles themselves? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, uh, data sets, uh, most of data come from the vehicle. And uh, I don't know if there is a way to which we can get some data shared in a better way, such data? Um, yeah, um, I, I, I think a lot of companies are making their um, contributions in this uh, area. And, and we actually have been making some data open. Uh, so that is, uh, that is an ongoing thing. So it's not really uh, hiding data from uh, others. It's, uh, there's data out there. Um, as for the role of uh, simulation technologies, I'm looking at what we used to do uh, many years ago. We started uh, with a network simulator. We used to add random walk <laughs> in many years ago. And then people said, OK, your cars cannot really go to the, the mountains and, and on top of the building. So we started using traffic simulations. Um, and 
and that kind of uh, you know saturated the system and it kind of affected the number of cars that you can simulate in the system. Next, we started adding a sensor on top of the vehicle that further slowed down the things. We started adding more sensors. And then uh, at some point, we started adding driver models. And at some point, we started uh, visualizing them in a 3D environment. And, and, and that has already become really complicated. But it's still very, very helpful because you can update uh, a system outside and test it every time you have a new, uh, new idea. So uh, I, I think the role of simulation will continue uh, growing. Thank you, Anu. Stefano, before I didn't allow you to, to talk and to answer, it's your turn, please go ahead. <laughs> no, no problem. So I think if we look at the traditional manual vehicle, the vehicle is uh, tested traditionally in, um, in a test site and the driver logic is uh, tested in a driving school. Uh, so the question is how, we, how can we do that when the driver is a machine? And not only that, it's a machine that is probably going to get updated regularly, maybe almost on a weekly basis. So th these are our open questions. I don't have the answers, but I believe it's definitely a research field. There are opportunities for digital twins, maybe uh, related to also what Alessandro mentioned, but even in, in, um, in larger scales, uh, I think it's essential to, to test the full system in a complex situation with all the computational issues that we have. Uh, especially when we go in in a cooperative driving type of uh, situations, but uh, it's not just about the the testing. It's also about deciding um, the basically somewhat the pro the rules of the road. What uh, are vehicles expected to listen to each other and to act based on that? To what extent can they do what they want? To what extent can they ignore what they're told? These are uh, questions which actually are more difficult to answer than, than what it seems because they are full of liability implications. Thank you, Stefano. You have anticipated somehow the next, uh, the next question. I don't know if Maxim uh, would like to add something more. Yeah, so first, uh, I think that Onur perhaps did not mention it, but, uh, um, and he should have, uh, is that the, um, the, the real world data sets that are collected by the vehicle manufacturers are very sensitive kind of data. Uh, they, and the vehicle manufacturers are very conservative uh, when, when it comes to share these data sets. So I would say uh, open data um, uh, research is, is not something that is really, um, the the main the mainstream um, work that the vehicle manufacturers would like to do what what they would like to do is that uh, they could use these data sets in order to improve their algorithm etc and there there is clearly a role from the academics and the and the research uh, community uh, but that only comes when you start uh, having a bilateral um, uh, cooperation with the vehicle manufacturers and 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 where you build up trust and uh, and um, and eventually get access to these data sets um, i don't think that uh, we we in in this case we don't live in a in a in a dream world and and um, and the data sets are actually assets of the vehicle manufacturers on which they can build quite a lot of new services. And we, we have to, as researchers, um, play with their game, let's say, uh, rather than uh, uh, do some, a little bit of wishful thinking, let's say. Thank okay. you, thank you, thank you, Maxim. That's a good point and good that you have uh, highlighted uh, the, the good way uh, for interacting with uh, manufacturers. So last question is uh, about the non-technology related issues. Uh, from the technology point of view, it seems that there are several challenges, of course, that it's good for us 
uh, as researchers, but at least uh, something can be addressed and uh, some challenges could be, uh, could be easily uh, solved. But uh, we have uh, other issues lying ahead. We have issues related uh, to the skepticism from people. Uh, would you trust your self-driving vehicle, for instance? Uh, we have issues related to regulation. Regulation can be uh, somehow a blocker for the innovation itself. We have security, we have mentioned it before, and we have again these, uh, I would not say fight, but we, we have this uh, uh, kind of uh, conflict between the automotive and tech world that uh, could work together for improving the performance of the technology. And uh, somehow, uh, and, and at least until uh, some years ago, they follow different directions and different speeds. This is uh, the main mm, provocative aspect of this, of, this, uh, of this question. So I would like you to share your, um, your opinions, your perspectives about these uh, uh, issues that uh, could actually break down the deployment uh, of the uh, of these technologies in the next years. So, uh, would would like to, to start uh, among you this time? Any volunteer? Uh, Cla Claudia, I would like to say, I mean, of course, you know, every every new system has its challenges and uh, obviously you're listing some of them. Uh, now, is it going to uh, break down the, the, the deployment? No, no, I wouldn't say so. It's going to slow down or it's going to perhaps take its space. Um, uh, each challenges have to be addressed and there is a large community to do so. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't single out one uh, here. Uh, there, there, are, there are challenges in terms of regulations. There are challenges in terms of security threat. What, what is important is, is to see it as a, 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 a breadth, a, a large amount of, um, of issues that, are, that cannot be treated by one single um, uh, industry or one single sector or one, one, uh, one person uh, having the, all the knowledge. It has to be a community knowledge here. Thank you, Maxime. We, we have mentioned uh, Telco World and Automotive World, Stefano and Honor. You have the next. Maybe applause to, to, to Maxime. I think you explained it much better than what I would have said, but I completely agree with what you say. It's, um, I mean, if we fail to, you know, to, to create a good environment for uh, sharing sensors, then the vehicles will use own sensors. It, they will be a bit more expensive and a bit less efficient, but that will not stop. Uh, it will not be a, a road stop. But anyway, I, I think the biggest issue I see is actually fragmentation. Uh, it's fragmentation in different ways. Uh, I think every now and then there is a, a bit of, um, you know, uh, desire for uh, one purpose technologies. I think those probably are not the best. They can be very good at solving one specific problem, but may not be the best solution in the in the long term. Uh, and uh, it's a very fragmented um, ecosystem where operators are local, while the UNMs are global, and we have lots of different players and new ones coming and. Uh, and um, creating sometimes, uh, um, let's say, innovation is too fast sometimes compared to standardization, and that creates de facto standards which are then difficult to inter make interoperable. So I think these are, I believe, some of the biggest challenges. Thank you, Stefano. You said uh, right when. You said that uh, fragmentation is a big issue and we should uh, uh, pursue for sure the interoperability and the harmonization. I guess that these, these two aspects are crucial for um, B2X to actually be a reality. I don't know if Honor could add something on this question. Thank you, Claudia. Um, 
so the, 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 this is my personal view. Um, so going from zero automation to full automation uh, in just one step is, I, I, I think personally, I think really hard. So it need to be coming um, in steps and maybe in small steps. And in each steps, we sh should be sure that that system, and it's not a single system, it's a system of systems. If you also think about this uh, uh, V2X part, we, we need to make sure that it works in a trustable way. Uh, we cannot just say, okay, this system works 90% of the time or 95% of the time. The, the reliability level is really high, needs to be high. Thank you. Thank you, Honor. Falco, Alessandro, would you add more on this? We have still time before this Maybe. The, uh, open Maybe. question from the audience. Maybe I. I could add uh, just that uh, all, all the things that were said and what is written here is all linked by a general issue in between that we need 100% penetration to have really uh, what we want from between if we have 10% it's not like other verticals are uh, uh, like uh, automation at home just one home is is fine or uh, consumer uh, a phone can be different from the others here we need 100% uh, penetration, that, that makes everything very, very difficult. Would be a great challenge to achieve this, uh, this number. And, uh, but of course, to make the technology works, so we, uh, we should go in the, this direction. Falco, I guess that you are uh, the, the, last, uh, for, uh, the last one for the answering this question. I'm the last, that's fine. I'm, uh... Um, let me let me add to what Ono said. Um, so he doesn't believe that uh, we change from uh, zero automation to full automation in, in instantly. And this is very correct. No? So we will see a transition phase and possibly this transition phase will never end. We don't know. Um, and what does it bring is additional very interesting uh, 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 challenges here. And that is while this transition phase continues, the human will always be in the loop. So the human user will make parts of the decisions on the road. Um, so cooperative driving is not just a coordination between technical systems, um, but it's coordination between partly technical systems and partly humans. And um, this is something where we have to go in our research very interdisciplinary because uh, now we need collaborations with psychologists and, and uh, other people from the humanities uh, who understand decision-making by human beings much better than we do in order to understand on, uh, how these human drivers that can at least partially influence the driving style of the car will interact with their cars. So there's actually an entirely new research domain that is going beyond what we call uh, cyber-physical systems, and that is now called cyber-physical social systems, where the human is, a, is an integral part of the, of the system. And um, we have to understand about actions uh, and how we to influence actions from the, from the human uh, um, part of the system um, by means of incentivations, by means of training, by means of integration, um, better interfacing in order to, uh, let's say, survive this transition period, which I believe will be very, 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 very long. So it's, it's worth looking into this. Good, very good point. Your, your, last, uh, your last points uh, are uh, very, very interesting. And uh, for sure, we should, uh, we should start from, uh, from them in order to, to build these, uh, this uh, evolution of the, the technology. And uh, now we are at the end of the, uh, this uh, part of the, the panel. And uh, there is still room for a question from, uh, from the audience, if any. 
Otherwise, uh, um, in the meanwhile, maybe uh, the audience could, uh, could write into the chat the, the questions and I would uh, read it for uh, the panelists. Uh, in the meanwhile, I would like to, to touch another, another topic that uh, have not been uh, touched so far, but uh, I guess uh, that uh, we are somehow obliged to touch it. Uh, it is uh, somehow written uh, in, uh, in our background. Uh, the main theme of the conference is uh, towards sustainable 6G. And uh, some of you mentioned uh, uh, electric vehicles uh, in the chase term. There was an E at the end that uh, stands for electric, uh, but we had not the chance to analyze uh, the issue of sustainability, both from the point of view of the uh, environmental issues and from the uh, societal perspective as well. So I would like uh, you to share some, uh, some perspectives, some ideas uh, about uh, the sustainability in the field of uh, V2X uh, connectivity and uh, vehicular applications in, uh, in general. We would uh, jump in uh, on this uh, extra question, I would say. Yeah, uh, Claudia, I'll start because um... Uh, I mean, in general, um, if you optimize or um, according to the right uh, criteria, or if you are um, connecting devices uh, together, in general, what you can do is to optimize for better, um, uh, better sustainable traffic uh, situation or road network. So. What a lot of people are telling me, oh yeah, but we need to make a lot of studies, you know, we need to do plenty of things around um, uh, B2X and the sustainability impact of it. Y yes, it would be great, but we cannot wait for three, four, five, ten years. Uh, you know, you just have to, you, you have to assume that by, by applying the right criteria, uh, you're going to uh, impact also the sustainability uh, when when you perhaps the first target was safety, the second target was efficient traffic, and then the eventual uh, impact on on sustainability is not always clear, but it's there. You know, if you avoid an accident, then uh, you avoid also all the traffic that is um, that is coming uh, in uh, after after the accident. So. Um, at the same time, what we see is that the European Commission or, or, or others around it are really all at the moment really, really only thinking of, uh, of this uh, green deal and, and impact on sustainability. And so then, we, of course, we have to give our answers, but I'd like to be sometimes a bit pr pragmatic and saying that if, if, if we solve, if we address one uh, or two of the aspects, we can also address the third one in a smart way. Thank you, Maxime. Yeah, in 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 the same path of uh, of, of Maxime, uh, if the vehicle has more information to 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 perform its actions, it's clear that it can have a, a smoother way, and traffic can be reduced, and um, brakes can use less, and and this is all in the direction of sustainability. Yeah clear to understand for everyone, maybe more difficult to demonstrate, but it's it's absolutely clear. Yeah. Yes, sustainability is somehow native, uh, natively addressed uh, in, uh, in the V2X context, but uh, sustainability can be seen from different angles. Uh, and I remember that Stefano mentioned also the issues related to the cost. Uh, it's not only the societal uh, aspect and environmental issues. <laughs> Yeah, indeed. I think, I mean, sustainability can mean very different things. Um, it's, uh, it, it can, it's, in some cases, it's about uh, having a sustainable ecosystem that, that, that makes sense from a business perspective. Otherwise, we will not achieve the other more uh, societal goals, which are, of course, uh, very important. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, there it's it's a complex puzzle, um, but I think we're we're pretty lucky that we work in a field which uh, has clear benefits for society today. Uh, 
uh, it's not just about the environment it's also giving possibility to people um, who don't have the chance to drive a car anymore to to move around uh, we can even think about the remote areas um, where the elderly uh, rate is very high and maybe you know these areas are losing population i think if we it's it's actually easier to to perform autonomous driving in those areas and maybe it's a good idea to also start from those areas because the societal benefit uh, given especially to the elderly population there uh, would be really great yeah but for this we need the very first use case that you have mentioned uh, you and maxim teleoperated driving uh, who needs uh, all uh, that we have discussed in order to achieve this uh, real inclusiveness. I, I guess that, uh, that's, that's a very challenging point to address. Falco and Donor, would you like to add something more about this last question on sustainability? So Uno isn't fast enough to turn on the mic, so I start. Um, Sustainability, yeah, uh, everybody, uh, everybody's talking about sustainability. It's a very important topic. And um, for us, it's uh, relevant on, on multiple stages. Um, so um, first and foremost, I'm a telecommunication networks engineer. So that is uh, my main field. Uh, so for that, uh, we have been looking into um, how, can we, how can we make our networks um, um, a little bit energy, more energy efficient, um, uh, already starting with 5G. Um, and we move on. And one of the main components here is um, uh, always the question how can better we can turn off some parts of the network, um, play around with densification of our network uh, so that we have the right level of densification for the amount of users. And, and exactly this, this line of thought, um, and Uno can, can continue here. Um, uh, we are also working on. In, on um, Making making cars cars part of the network um, so to enable um, the the cars to to partially fulfill networking capabilities on behalf of the of the uh, uh, fixed infrastructure when they are just needed and they are it's needed when the cars are there to stop and uh, possibly. Um, only one car is sufficient uh, to provide an uplink to the to the uh, 5G, 6G network, and everything else can be done just on the side link. Uh, everything else can be done by V2V communications. Um, that contributes at least. Yeah? And I haven't even started talking about electric vehicles, um, and, and I will not because it's not the, the topic of a, of, a, of, a, of a day really. Um, but we can do a lot, and um, we do. Um, so thank you for that question. I don't know if my video is wrong. Okay, thanks. Uh, um, I, I, I can only add that the, uh, the term carbon neutrality is becoming an important um, aspect of what we all do. Um, and it's, uh, it's not only moving a, um, a, the vehicle itself, that's the, it's a thousand kilogram uh, metal body from point A to point B, you now also need electricity that is draining a lot of power from the system for uh, these communication systems, for computing systems, and, and for the rest of the sensors. Thank you. Thank you, Honor. So I guess that we are approaching uh, the end of the schedule of uh, our panel. I don't know if there are uh, questions uh, from, from the audience, you can uh, write them uh, into the chat. Otherwise, uh, uh, likely you should have also your mic on so you can uh, directly switch on your, uh, your mic if you would like to, to have your uh, questions uh, live. Otherwise, I guess that we have touched many topics and I guess that we have covered uh, almost uh, 
all the issues, uh, for sure, not all, but at least uh, most of the issues related to this uh, very complex and challenging uh, landscape. And uh, I would like to, to thank uh, the audience and uh, the panelists for their time and for sharing uh, uh, their uh, perspectives and uh, especially for uh, having this uh, live discussion and though they also spend time for <laughs> preparing the recording during summer it was not so, so good I, I know but I, I would like to to thank them uh, for, uh, for this effort and uh, I would like to thank of course the organizers for giving us uh, this slot and uh, for hosting uh, this panel and I guess it is the very last panel of the of the conference. So from my side, uh, it's all. Thank, thank you, you Claudia. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks. Thank you. It was a, a very interesting opportunity, and thank you. Thank you from my end as well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank Claudia for organizing this event and she did a tremendous work on this and um, it was marvelous. Thank you. Thank you, Falco. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.